In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. So at Low Impact, we're interviewing people who are working to build a new kind of world. We want to promote what they're doing and find ways to work together. Today, I'm talking with Sean Chamberlain. Hi, Sean. Hi, Dave. Hi, now I've known you quite a while. Um, you left the board of the Ecological Land Co-op as I joined. I replaced you on the board. Yep. Um, you've been involved with the Transition Network. You wrote the Transition Timeline, is that right? I did, yep, 2009 that was. And your website is called uh, Dark Optimism. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. And you've done lots of interesting things. I think for me, this is possibly the most interesting. <laughs> this is, uh, you took uh, David Fleming's work and you continued it after he died and you, you produced this book, Lean Logic. Subtitle is a, a dictionary for the future and how to survive it, which sounds yeah. on, which sounds ominous. <laughs> and is <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I would say that's that's probably what I'm most excited about about the various things I've I've done in my life to date as well. I think um, you know David was was a real mentor to me and uh, and his work is really something special. I know you you reviewed it back when it came out and uh, were very very positive about it. So I'm sure lots of your viewers are, are familiar with the work. It's just and also. I'll just also this um, paperback surviving the future that I edited out from that that huge work as a kind of uh, gateway drug into the work as I call yeah. it sometimes. It's just a treasure trove. I absolutely recommend it. You, you, it's hours of fun. A tre treasure trove. So um, surviving the future. So where do you think we're headed as a species? I mean, we, we have people like uh, Jem Bendel tell us that we're headed for some sort of collapse. So we'd better get ready for it emotionally and in terms of you know physical preparedness. But you also have people like Jordan Peterson and Bjorn Lomborg. They tell us not to worry. We're better off now than we've ever been. And human ingenuity and technology and economic growth will see us through. Where do you stand? Where do you think we're headed? Uh, I'm very much at the Jem Bendel end of that particular spectrum. Um, I think one of the things that's so interesting about David Fleming is even back in the sort of 80s, um, by then he'd been involved with starting what's now the Green Party in this country, um, with the Soil Association. Um, and even back then he'd come to the point of thinking, ah, we're not really going to change direction here, are we? You know, he was doing all the, all the lobbying and the campaigning and the writing and trying to say to people, look, this really isn't sensible what we're doing to our ecology in particular, but also to our, to our culture. And, um, and yeah, it's really interesting that even sort of 40 years ago, um, he thought, yeah, there's too much momentum economically and, and culturally behind this kind of growth and, and ec ec economics obsession. Um, it's not going to change direction. And so that was when he started work on that dictionary for the future and how to survive it that you were brandishing, because he really thought, well, the most important work I can do now and work that nobody was really doing then is a think about how it makes sense to prepare for the crash that is inevitably coming if we don't change direction. I mean, you know, I think I think people often have this sense that, ah, you know, nothing fundamentally ever really changes. You know, people talk a big game, but things just kind of plod on. But I would say we're at a point now where radical change is, is, is very clearly inevitable because either we change direction radically or we end up where we're headed, which looks nothing like today. So either way, radical change is coming. And David's thinking was A, how do we prepare for that? But B, most interestingly, the starting point for his work really is what will it look like after we don't change our ways? You know, what will it, what will a post-collapse world look like and how do we prepare for that? How do we start developing and building the things now that might make sense there? And for him to 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 massively distill down what, as you say, is a is a is a huge tome. Um, I would say for, for David and for me, the two things that make sense are the two sources of security that have always sustained life in the absence of a kind of thriving monetary economy. Um, and one of those is the natural world, of course, um, which is currently under assault and needs, needs defending and restoring. And the other is what David Fleming calls the informal economy, what people call the gift economy or the non-monetary economy, 
um, you know, the ways that people relate to each other that aren't mediated by money, like what we're doing right now. You know, nobody's getting paid for what we're doing here, um, but we're doing it because it's it's meaningful and important to us. Um, and so those, I think, are the are the pillars that make sense to me for for shaping and building our future and and the sequel to our present society, the the natural world and the and the non monetary world of, of relationships and culture. Yeah, I want to come back to lots of things you just said there, um, but uh, people like um, Jordan Peterson, Bjorn Lomborg, I mean, I agree with some of the things that they say, but they paint themselves as um, scientific and logical, uh, mm. but with every discipline except ecology, they seem to ignore ecologists as if they're not scientists, and ecologists are telling us that we're destroying life on Earth. It's like, how, how much clearer could they get, and yet it's just, it's just brushed aside. So I just don't understand why some people who paint themselves as scientific just ignore ecologists. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think what we face is like a rift in realism. Um, you know, like people on both sides of this debate point themselves, paint themselves as realists, um, but they're, they're referring to different realities. Um, you know, there's kind of a realist with regard to social reality who says, ah, well, you know, you can't really expect people to change fundamentally. Or you've got, as you say, a, a realist with regard to kind of ecological and physical reality, uh, who just says, well, you know, if they don't, the changes will be done to them. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, physics doesn't negotiate. And, and what I, one thing I really love that doesn't get picked up on much in a, in a, in a kind of classic book, Aldo Leopold's San County Almanac, is there's a little note where he describes ecology as uh, animal economics. And I, I really like that because- Could you say that author and book again? Yeah, Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac, which is a, yeah, which is a, a classic out of America of kind of early ecological thinking. I still didn't, um, didn't get the first word, something County Almanac. Sand, like on a sand. beach. Sand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely not the thrust of the book, but there's just this little note where he, he just sort of in passing mentions, you know, ecology, or as we might call it, animal economics. And I love that because it brings home to us what economics actually is. You know, it's, it's how, we, how we meet our needs, like what we do with our time, like how we provide ourselves with shelter and food and water. And of course, the non-human world has solutions and approaches to those very same problems too. Um, and we can, as soon as we recognize that those are economic questions, they suddenly seem much more real and pertinent and, and ours. Yeah than this word economics that can make everything seem like, oh, none of our business and a bit intimidating and scary. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, the likes of Jordan Peterson tend to um, kind of gloss over very, very dramatically um, that all creatures on earth face these same problems. And that, as you say, we are explicitly and, and, and very closely, in a very closely scientifically studied way, absolutely undermining the basis of, yeah. of all economic wealth. Yeah, I think um, some people are just scared to look at the status quo, aren't they? They just they just can't see any alternative to the status quo. They saw what happened in the 20th century, scared the life out of them. Let's not do that again. Let's not rock the boat. Let's just try and have little tweaks and reforms, but not really question the status quo. Um, well, yes, I, I think also, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't in any way afraid to question things or recognize how fundamentally inappropriate or even wrong things are, but don't really see what on earth we can do about it. Um, um, yeah. and, I, and I always think it's, it's actually perfectly rational if faced with an immense problem which you can't actually do anything about, it's actually perfectly rational to ignore it and give your attention more to things that you can have a positive impact on. Yeah. Um, the question is, are these huge problems actually correctly placed in that category of things we can't do anything about or or are there in fact ways that we can engage with them in a meaningful way yeah well practicals i'm most interested in trying to find practical solutions uh, that's what our website is all about uh, your website's called dark optimism yeah. uh, so that was the dark bit um what about the optimism so where, where do you see optimism coming from what what can we actually do um and also what are you going to do uh, and and what what do you think we should do as a species? Is, is what's achievable and how? Okay, so 
dark optimism yeah uh you know bright shiny optimism winds me up because you know these are not bright and shiny times um but at the same time there's nothing about the situation that we're in as a as a culture or as a species that prevents us from telling stories we're proud to tell with our lives um you know we can still have beautiful existences in the context that we're in now and that's really all anyone has ever been able to ask i think um and so consequently um yeah my approach is you know i sometimes say i'm unashamedly positive about the kind of lives we could create but unashamedly realistic about how far we are from creating those collectively um and so yeah coming back to the question of of what to do i mean for me i'm in some ways less focused on that question about what do we do as a species because that for me falls into the category of there's not necessarily a huge amount i can do at that scale mm, yeah um and i find that the you know the two things we're always told to do are you know personal lifestyle change and lobbying political representatives right yeah, yeah. and I think they're both really depressing, actually, yeah. <laughs> because you know, although that you know, there's a lot to be said for personal lifestyle change, and I do plenty of it myself. Um, nonetheless, I don't see it as a particularly effective way of, of transforming the wider world. And that, if that's your aim, that can be quite depressing to kind of, you know, do all the things that your wonderful website explains how to do, and then realise that the whole world is charging in the opposite direction can be can be quite upsetting. It's and a bit like time, a, yeah, sorry, a what? bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And we, right. we, we, we hear that a lot, you know, people speak, we, we can solve our problems by electing the right party or by consuming from or investing in the right corporations. We hear that a lot. And yeah, it, um, it doesn't so really chime what, with me at all. What this, what this comes down to for me is scale. So the problem with personal lifestyle change is it's too small scale to affect the things that you're trying to affect. Yeah. The problem with lobbying political representatives is that you're a drop in the ocean, you don't get heard, you get ignored. And that's because they're too large scale effectively they're operating up here and you're just this tiny voice and can have no impact um and so for me what's really nourishing and meaningful is bringing things to a scale between those two which we often call the human scale um which is where you're operating on the level of a community um which is large enough that you can make real impacts on your life and the life of people around you but small enough that your voice and contribution is actually significant and doesn't get lost um and so I mean, there's a there's a line in the in the dictionary for the future and how to survive it, which is my favourite line of that entire wonderful book with many wonderful turns of phrase, which is uh, large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within large scale frameworks. Um, and it's those frameworks that enable the diversity of small scale solutions that are appropriate to their local context to come into place. And so really over the last 15 years or so since I encountered that that line and that insight, that's what I've been doing is is building those frameworks. So the Ecological Land Cooperative is one of those frameworks. It's a, it's a framework that enables individual families to get on the land and love that land on, in the way that's appropriate to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the transition movement is one of those frameworks for diversities of local action. Um, even, you know, the dictionary is one of those frameworks. It's not saying everyone should do this. It's saying here's a bunch of principles to apply in the way that you know best in the context of your life and your situation. And the thing that I'm most focused on at the moment is these this sort of educational um, online program that I've developed called uh, Surviving the Future Conversations for Our Time, which again is offering frameworks for people to both engage with, with David Fleming's work, but also with each other and, and creating a sort of global network of superheroes who are, who are trying to do work in their local communities, in their local areas in various ways, but are supporting and connecting with each other. So for right, me, okay, that's, so that's, that's the key insight is small scale solutions within large scale frameworks. That so we'll, is we'll put a link, we'll put a link to that course uh, below in the, who, who, who's it aimed at? Yeah, well, so if people want to look up the course, the easiest way is go to your favorite search engine, put in Sterling College, Surviving the Future. Uh, how are we, spe how we spelling Sterling? Uh, that's with an E, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G, although yep. I'm sure search engines can cope. Yep. Um, and, uh, and who is it aimed at? Well, 
so we've been doing this now for a couple of years. Um, we've had participants from every continent on Earth, including Antarctica. <laughs> we had we had a scientist based at the Antarctic <laughs> Science Station join us last time, which was fantastic to complete the set. <laughs> that is quite a thing. Um, we've had we've had an age range from 19 to 93 so far. Um, uh, so yeah, we're 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 really aimed at people. People for whom dark optimism makes sense, actually. People who are sick of turning a blind eye to what's happening, but are also sick of, I guess, sick of both kind of fatalistic doom mongering and green dream idealism, like both of which are not very helpful in my opinion, and are interested in kind of walking that narrow path between the two where you're simultaneously acknowledging that many of our problems are becoming predicaments because you know they're no longer solvable they're more things that we just have to come to terms with like you know the fact that you're going to die is a predicament not, not a problem even though some techno gurus like to try and convince you otherwise yeah um and uh and yeah so really it's aimed at, it's aimed at that and and i would say actually a big part of our demographic if that's the right word has been um kind of burned out and despairing folk um you know often people who've been banging away at this stuff for decades and and are finding it really hard to not just go well we're losing or we've lost you know and are just really in quite a dark space um that's yeah that's almost become a, a um a specialist subject for me having been to those dark places myself um and so we do a lot of work around um yeah, very honest conversations about um, about despair and about grief and about the the situation that we're in right now, um, and the the kind of what I what my friend Michael Dowd calls the the post doom motivation that can come after that, where you um, rather than this constant process that lots of people go through of of kind of pushing down their despair like oh i i must stay positive you know i must i must must just not even allow that thought to exist which is incredibly draining it's incredibly tiring to constantly deny what you actually believe is true and, i meet lots and of people time, who do it right and every time more difficult information comes in you're like oh god i can't look at that and whereas my experience and the experience of many others who've been with us through these courses is that if you actually look this stuff square in the face, admit what you really believe, cry, you know, face how much it hurts to not be able to make certain things right. It, it can feel like that's going to end you, you know, like you're just going to fall apart and shatter. But it doesn't. And you kind of wake up one day and think, OK, you know, here I am in what I feared, you know, here I am in a in a in a society that's headed in a direction I loathe or, or on a, even on a dying planet, whatever it is that, that seems to you to be the reality of your situation, you still wake up one day and if you can face that, the, the question is still there, okay, well, what am I going to do with my day? And then in that kind of post-doom space, that motivation feels very different because then your only question is, what story do I want to tell with my life? And there's no information that can come in that can tell you you're wasting your time in doing that. Like mm. if you've decided, okay, you know, the whole thing's going to hell in a handbasket, but nonetheless, I'm going to create this beautiful garden or I'm going to raise a beautiful family or I'm going to try and keep this species alive as damn long as I can or whatever it may be, mm. whatever your calling is. That's a much stronger, deeper motivation and the energy that's released by being able to honestly look at the world as you believe it is, is is immense it's just a, a, a wellspring that bubbles up because then yeah you're doing what you want with your days rather than living in denial and i guess that in many ways is the the kind of deeper meaning of, of dark optimism if you like that sounds very similar to jem bendel's deep adaptation approach yeah i know jem quite well i mean um yeah i think he has in many ways taken a lot of concepts i've been working with quite a long time in in his deep adaptation work I mean, I actually think the original deep adaptation paper um, was to a large extent a work of despair, Jem's despair. Like he had no idea it was going to go viral in the way that it did. And I think he it was really just, did, yeah. um, you know, he was just kind of working through his his despair at the state of the kind of sustainability world that he was operating in and how divorced from reality it was. And I think that shows like I would never actually recommend to anyone 
go and read the deep adaptation paper because I don't think it's actually that kind of skillful a work in how it deals with that despair. But where Jem and that movement have gone since, I think, has become an incredibly skillful movement in dealing with that that initial impulse of despair. And there's been a lot has, of great yeah. work done on um, on how how to respond to that. Um, so in some ways, the kind of totemic paper there, I think, is 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 a is a poor representation of, of the wider movement that's that's grown up around it and and wonderfully yeah. so. I posted. And indeed, uh, we, have, we have many many people involved with deep deep adaptation have joined us on our courses. Right. Years. Okay. Yeah. Now, I posted something from Jem once, which was um, how, how to deal with people who, who say, I oh, don't worry about it, we'll be fine, you know, technology will get us through this, we'll be fine. Or, you know, it's not as bad as, uh, you know, ecologists say it is, you know, look out the window, the trees are still there, the birds are still singing. Uh, it's, it sort of lays out different approaches and, and what to say to people who, who are coming from a different angle. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I, I, equally, it is important to remember that the birds are still singing and the sun is still there. Like, it's really easy to lose ourselves completely in dark imaginings and, and, and horrific futures and, and lose track of the moment. As I say, it, it really is a, a sort of path between Schiller and Charybdis, this kind of idealised green dream techno fix idea and you know we're utterly doomed and everything's worthless and I might as well kill myself. Mm. Um, you know, there really is a... a maybe a relatively narrow path between those but certainly yeah. i think it's the one worth walking and it's 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 worth a shot isn't it i mean it's 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 you never know what can come of, of the kind of things that you do um the kind of conversations you have with people um who knows yeah. what can yeah what can come i mean that that's true but for me the kind of the post do motivation is is not actually predicated on outcomes really i mean obviously you try and do what you can to create the outcomes you want to create but um but i think ultimately you know there have been people who've been born into far more hopeless situations than you or i could ever imagine um you know there have been people who've lived in in concentration camps and you know that they've written yeah. about finding meaning in that existence so if you or i you know in our situation want to say oh everything's so awful what's the point of even getting out of bed in the morning i think it's it's quite indulgent in a way I think um, the, the first time i came across the, this kind of approach was, was um mark simmons who's a, co a cooperative development worker and uh, i interviewed him and said you know why why are you interested in developing co-ops and he said because we're going to crash and i just want to build lifeboats and i thought that was really i thought it really took me aback i wasn't expecting it at all i just thought he was going to be a very practical sort of Let's build, let's cooperativize the economy sort of guy. But he said, no, we're going to crash and I want to build lifeboats. I mean, in my experience, the movements that really catch the zeitgeist have space for both people who are, you know, trying to make society a little better or more sustainable or fairer, and people who are kind of preparing for a collapse or indeed are completely opposed to the society, which is incredibly exploitative and, and corrupt and everything else. Um, and, you know, transition, extinction, rebellion, you know, within these movements, I've met a lot of people who represent very different points of view. But nonetheless, the things that it makes sense to do are very similar. Again, mm. like neither of those camps are in any way opposed to this agenda of yeah, yeah, yeah. let's let's rebuild, you know, our, our culture and our communities and let's rebuild and defend the natural world. Um, those, those things absolutely make sense, regardless of your analysis of what collapse means, whether it's already unfolding, how far it might away it might be in a certain place, etc. Yeah, 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 yeah.